Jacob, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Blessings and honor and glory and might be unto the Lamb. Worthy is Christ, who has ransomed us by his blood from every tribe and tongue and nation, and made his people a kingdom, a priest to our God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Let us pray. Let us confess our sins before Almighty God and each other. Almighty God, who gave your Son, Jesus Christ, a realm where all peoples, nations, and languages serve. Make us loyal followers of our living Lord, that we may always hear his word, follow his teaching, and live in his spirit, and hasten the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to your eternal glory. Thanksgiving is a season where we join together with our friends, families, around our table that usually have a big spread of food. We give thanks for the blessing in our life and we call all the good we've experienced throughout the year. Experts say that having a great attitude is good for us. And looking at all the blessings we have in our life makes us realize that things aren't as bad as we sometimes think they are. It changes our perspective, it reduces our stress, and it boosts our mood. For many in our society, giving thanks is simply a feel-good exercise of greater self-fulfillment. It's also contingent upon the things that are going right. When work's going well, when relationships are thriving, when hard work is rewarded with success, there's a reason to give thanks. But when dreams fail, sickness take hold and relationships fall apart, Giving thanks seems hard, and sometimes it seems almost impossible. But for believers in Jesus Christ, giving thanks looks a bit different. It's not about self-fulfillment, following social network trends. There's a different reason for us as Christians giving thanks and there's a different source for our gratitude. It's not contingent upon our circumstances, and its purpose is not to make us feel better. In fact, it's not about us at all. We give thanks to God because God is our creator and our sustainer. 
Each breath we take comes from God. It reminds us that we're not our own gods and that we can do nothing apart from God's grace. God is holy, righteous, and good. He's worthy of all honor and praise. No matter what's happening in our life, no matter the challenges we may face, there's always a reason to give thanks because God deserves it. We can simply thank Him for who He is. Paul tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always, and to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Giving thanks to God is something believers do all of the time. Not just once a year in November and not just when life is going well. It ought to be a continuous posture of our heart. Our greatest reason to give thanks is because we've been brought from death to life. God has shown him goodness faithfulness to us through the death of his son on our behalf. Because of Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. And the list of benefits and joys associated with having endless life in Christ goes on and on. We were made to worship, made to praise and give thanks to God. This Thanksgiving, there is much to be thankful for. From our very life of eternal life, from God's goodness to his steadfast love, from the wonders of knowing God to the deep joy of being known by him, we have many reasons to give thanks. May giving thanks to our Lord be the joy of our heart this Thanksgiving and every day throughout the year. Happy Thanksgiving to you and all of your family. And now let us pray together our prayer of illumination. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may live and stand into your truth and talk over it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I thank Pilate's question from our scripture today is the defining question of our culture. What is the truth? Leslie Newbig wrote a book called The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society. And he reminds us in his book about an ancient fable from India of the blind man and men and the elephants, and it's popularized by the American poet John Dodson Stack. I'm sure some of you have heard the story of the blind man and the elephant. But to briefly talk about it, the original fable is told from the viewpoint of a king who leads several blind men to an elephant and asks them to tell him what it is that they are feeling. The first blind man walks up to this formidable side of this huge mammal and declares that it certainly was a wall that he had walked into. And the second holds the elephant's tusk and asserts that it was a spear. The third blind man felt the squirming trunk of the elephant, the elephant and jumped back saying it was no doubt a great snake. The fourth bumped into one of the beast's large legs and declared it to be a tree. Another was led by the king to the elephant's flapping ear and proclaimed that he had definitely found a fang. And the last blind man broke for what was before him and grabbing the elephant's tail was convinced that the thing before him was a rope. And this story is usually told to make, make the point that none of us grasp the whole truth. One person sees things one way, and another sees the truth a different way. So, and the story tells us that each of us are holding a part of the truth, and that everyone is right in his own way given that individual experience. And this story was especially used by people trying to say that all religions are the same, and that we just have different ways of talking about God and experiencing Him. After all, they say, we're all feeling the same elephant, but describing Him according to our limited perception. Boyd Sachs sees a religious significance in the fable and he ends his poem about it by saying so oft the theological wars, the disputants, I believe, rail on in utter ignorance of what each of them mean and prayed about an elephant, not one of them. 
And those who use this story try to point out that all religions are merely an attempt by men, blind men at that, to grow after the truth. However, those trying to make this point seem to miss several important problems with the story. First of all, as Newbigin points out, if a king were also blind, there would be no story. There would be no one to lead the blind man to anything. And we have to ask the question, why did the king only lead each man to a part of the problem instead of allowing them to experience as much as they could, as much as they were capable of understanding? And the most obvious loss of the fable is that even though there are some people that are born blind, most of us are born with the ability to see. Sight is a gift of God who wants us to see and to perceive. And another important fact is that rather than each of them having a portion of the truth, none of them had a part of the truth. They were all completely What they experienced was not a rock or snake or wall, it was an elephant. And the most important point is the elephant was still an elephant in spite of what their perceptions were. The elephant was unchanged by their imperfect understanding of what they were experiencing. So their misunderstanding came from their blindness. Still the question remains, how do we know that we are experiencing what we are experiencing is reality and truth? Do we have a hold of only part of God? And he, is he something or someone completely other than what we've experienced? Well, I want to try to make a few points to help us arrive at some understanding of the nature of truth and how we find it. The first point is truth is known through revelation. Truth exists, and God wants us to know the truth. This is the starting point of faith. The story of the blind man and the elephant. The king leads the men only to the part of the elephant he wants them to experience. He only allows them to have a partial revelation. And he never volunteers to correct that false perception. Neither does he offer any explanation. As Christians, we believe that we have a king who doesn't try to defraud us or to fool us. He doesn't toy with us. He doesn't deceive us or lead us in a way that confuses us or distorts our perception. We don't have a king that hides the truth from us but reveals the truth. Who? He wants us to know, to understand. When he walks us up to an elephant, even though we're blind, he shows us the entire mountain. He explains what it is. That's the ball. He heals that blind. He doesn't want us to live in darkness, but to live in light. He's given us eyes that an intelligence that we might understand. He's given us touch and smell and hearing and taste. We sing to him for the beauty of the earth. He said, linking sense to sound and sight, it is impossible for us to understand truth on our own, but God links sense of sound and sight. He uncovers truth for us and reveals 
Our King leads us toward truth, not misunderstanding. Neither does God leave us in a wilderness of conflict and truth to choose from. The Bible says that God has revealed himself to us in the nation. The psalmist writes, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. More than that, there is a beauty and a pleasure. A fragrant spring day should plainly tell us that God cares for us. He loves us. He blesses us. A walk through the woods helps us to feel his presence. Created order tells us many things about God, especially that He cares for us with great love. Paul explained this to the Greeks, where he said, Yet He has not left Himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in the seasons. He provides you with plenty of food. He fills your heart with joy. But there's more than God's revelation in nature that helps us to know Him, which enables us to be more than blind men groping for an elephant. God's ultimate revelation of truth was in Jesus Christ. And John wrote, That which was from the beginning, which we have not heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The light appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was the Father as he has appeared to us. The point is that we're not left to our own devices discover truth. Our King has led us to the truth. He has revealed truth and made himself known as the ultimate truth. And the second point I'd like to make this morning is that truth is known. Not only is there truth, but truth may be known. You know, I think we've gotten caught up in this trap of trying to argue whether there is absolute truth or not. Maybe we need to stick to the biblical idea rather than using philosophical terms like absolute. People misunderstand and think that we are saying that we are absolutely correct in everything that we believe. And we're not. No one has it all. No one has all the answers. But there are many things that we can know with confidence because truth is knowable. When we look at the book of John, we, we can find an interesting dialogue between Jesus and Philip. Jesus said, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you want to know what God is like? If so, all you have to do is look at Jesus. He is the embodiment of God. Truth is knowable because truth is a person. Truth is not an idea or proposition. 
truth is Jesus. He is the personification and the source of all truth. We know that we can know the truth because Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not recognizing the truth, not knowing the truth, keeps us in bondage and in spiritual darkness. And you might ask, well, why is this so important? And the third point I want to make is that truth creates passion. A passion for life is what makes us come alive. You can't be passionate about something without believing it. Perhaps the reason that more Christians are not passionate about their faith is because they've not placed their full trust and reliance on the truth of the scripture. What is scripture if not the best news the world has ever known? It is good news because it is God's news, God's truth about the world, God's truth about life and himself. If you're completely committed and in giving yourself over to God's truth, it will help you escape the despair and the negativity that dominates this unbelieving world that we live in. However, it's one thing to believe the Bible with intellectual aspect. It's quite another to allow the truth to transform you. <coughs> Truth must move from a flat construct of prepositional truth to a radical discipline that transforms our character, transforms our behavior. Truth can be a mental, a mental ascent to abstract information, or it can be a personal knowledge of God that brings life to the believer gives us new enthusiasm for life. There are a lot of people who get all torqued up about the world not believing in absolute truth, who do not live the simple truth of God himself. If you're going to believe the truth, you have to live the truth. And many of us can't have it. Truth does not just affect our thinking. It transforms our passion, transforms our desires. It fuels them, purifies them, redirects them. Truth is the door that allows us to come into the presence of God. Jesus said, now this is eternal life, that you may know that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The truth of the scripture is not contained in a list of rules that you have to perform. The truth of the scripture presents to you a person who you are invited to know. Truth is important. For well, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In our culture, we've come to think that truth is something which is negotiated or agreed upon by the majority. But it doesn't matter how many people are feeling the elephant and coming up with ideas, even if they agree that some are more correct than others, 
the elephant's still an elephant, and he exists. The elephant doesn't change into a rope because someone has him by his tail. He remains an elephant. His essence doesn't change just because a person or a plurality of persons see him differently. Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Truth exists because God is trustworthy. But the biblical understanding of truth is that all truth comes from God. Our experience of an objective reality is a result of the very character and nature of God. A pastor tells a story about what happened in the church. And this pastor writes that, I'll call the person Sue. Sue was first-time guest at our church. She'd come with a sister who, unlike her, was a follower of Jesus Christ. And when Sue was growing up in China, she was born an accomplished athlete and an intellectual. And after the close of Sunday worship, she expressed appreciation for the teaching and asked if there was an internet dialogue she could engage in. She said she had many questions about the existence of God and would like very much to pursue them. And the pastor goes on to say, in the midst of our conversation, I ventured into the mystical. I suggested to her that I knew something about her that we had never met. And she asked me what it was. And I stated that during the worship experience, God had revealed himself to her. And that this disturbed her, since she had no intellectual validation for his existence. And I told her it was my sense that beyond revealing himself, God had spoken to her and told her that Jesus was his name. There was an awkward silence. Her act, lack of eye contact, let this pastor know she was considering her response very carefully. And he says, I simply invited her to consider that it was okay to acknowledge whether or not this was her experience. And she quietly looked up and said, Yes. That was exactly right. And he says, I asked her if what she needed through the internet dialogue was the intellectual validation to support what her spirit already knew to be true. He said she gave me a resounding yes. And I assured her that we would be more than happy to help her brain catch up with her heart and her mind to catch up with her soul. The pastor goes on to say that it was hardly a day after this encounter when our emails began to read like the female version of the Apostle Paul, expressing a vibrant, dynamic, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. Truth is important. Truth is known. Because God and when you not only know it, but live it, and allow it to transform you, it creates a passion in your heart that will make you glad that you're alive. Thanks be to Jesus Christ, our King. I would invite you now to stand with me and confirm our faith by reciting together the Nicene Creed, it's found on page 880 in your memory. Together. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God of not made, a one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified on the conscious fire. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Spirit. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the Father. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Almighty and merciful God, you break the power of evil and make all things new in your Son, Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. May all heaven and earth proclaim your glory and never cease to praise you. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Now let us pray again from our prayer to the God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, Glory to Amen. Let us now pray together our offertory prayer. God of majesty and power, you have dominion over all the universe, and yet you choose to rule not in power, but in love. The gifts we give to you are not given from fear or in petition for your favor, but in the deepest gratitude for all your blessings that keep us and sustain us. May our whole lives reflect to the world that there is one who rules us with love and compassion above all this world's nations and principalities. In the name of your Son, Christ, we pray. Amen.
peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Amen. Thank you.